There you go. Okay. Rob moves through the first set of test cards without incident. But less than five minutes into the flight, Rob declares an emergency. Mask is still leaking. Okay, we're gonna have to go back. An oxygen leak is filling the cockpit with frigid and highly flammable gas. Rob must immediately jettison his fuel so the plane is light enough to land. The race is on to return to the field before disaster strikes. The oxygen-rich environment in the cockpit is highly flammable. Additionally, the ice-cold liquid oxygen is leaking against Rob's hip. He is sitting on his flight book to prevent frostbite. After what seems like an eternity, he lands E4 safely, but he must still get out as soon as possible. Back in operations, the test team is riveted to the video screen. Every emergency is reduced to a routine maintenance report. The problem is actually with my personal equipment not with the aircraft's equipment, uh, but uh, what occurred may have damaged some parts of the airplane's system, and so we're going to have to check those out. When a leak develops in the system and the oxygen comes pouring out, it's expanding so fast that it gets very, very cold. Flesh is susceptible to frostbite, and those coldest parts are something I'm sitting on. So my concern over, over uh, being burned by the cold temperatures is what caused me to point the airplane on deck <laughs> right away and, and get out of the cockpit. Okay, so oxygen tank was leaking oxygen, right? So suddenly expending oxygen end up giving him a frostbite. So why does the oxygen cool down to an extent while it's being suddenly expended to an extent that it gave him a frostbite? Two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission. And it is well, what started out as a grand achievement for NASA, 73 seconds later turned into a national tragedy. All right, so challenge of disaster, what caused it? Richard Feynman was an incredible scientist. He spent most of his time at Caltech. The idea of quantum physics, where all these particles are interacting in mysterious ways, he came up with a thing called Feynman diagrams that he won the Nobel Prize for. Perhaps even more importantly, he was an amazing teacher. He did a series of lectures, which were for people who didn't specialize in physics. It's such a great example of how he could explain things in a fun and interesting way to anyone. And he was very funny. Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun, was answered in certain terms by some people by saying that there were angels behind here feeding their wings and pushing the planet along around orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth. The only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the wings go. Dr. Feynman used a top process on himself where if he didn't really understand something, he would push himself. Do I understand this boundary case? Do I understand why we don't do it this other way? Do I really understand this? And because he had pushed himself to have such a deep understanding, his ability to take you through the path of the different possibilities was incredible. Now, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon, and if they get it near each other, they snap together. If you can get it faster by heating it up somehow, some way, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in, and that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster, so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms, and they jiggle, and they make mothers jiggle, and you get a terrible catastrophe. That catastrophe is a fire. He's taking something that is a little mysterious to most people and using very simple concepts to explain how it works. He doesn't even tell you he's talking about fire till the very end and you feel like you're kind of figuring it out together with him. Feynman made science so fascinating. He reminded us how much fun it is and everybody can have a pretty full understanding. So he's such a joyful example of you know, how we'd all like to, to learn and think about things. All right, so that guy is Richard Feynman. The biggest name in physics next to Einstein, believe it or not. And this guy happens to be one of my heroes. Every single lecture is designed in a way that we're following in his footsteps. That's the way we're doing physics right now. And that guy is gonna solve the puzzle of the Challenger disaster using real simple physics. Well, hey guys, Woo. it is 50 below here in Fairbanks. And uh, I thought I'd come out here with some hot water and throw it up in the air so you can see it just uh, fly away as a cloud. Man, it is cold. When it gets this cold, we get what we call ice fog. 
I just had to pay about 600 bucks to get my pipe stalled out because when it got down to 52 below last night, it froze up on this side of the house. So anyways, let's get some hot water and throw that in the air. It's not actually too bad for this cold as it is. All right, so I've got some hot water here. Let's go throw it in the air and see what happens. All right, so the hot water turned into ice crystals immediately. So what caused that to happen? There's a cloud just blowing away. That was cute. Okay. So we talk about kind of phase changes. And phase changes, phase changes, phase changes. So three, three expansion. Yeah, whatever that is. We'll have to find it. All right, so latent heat we were dealing with. All right, so the phases don't matter. At low temperature, matter okay, is so very solid. Fast review. A state in which molecules form a rigid geometrical lattice. Although close inspection shows they're always moving. At higher temperatures, solids melt and become liquids. Now the molecules are much less orderly and flow easily past each other. Raise the temperature further and liquids evaporate into gases. A state in which molecules don't adhere to one another, but bounce around instead. Okay, so, <clears throat> once again, potential energy is gonna be related to the relative distance between the molecules, and kinetic energy is gonna be related to the motion of the molecules. We talked about evaporation, condensation, and saturation. Okay, so, so far it's a fast review, all right. Let's talk about the kinetic theory of gases. So that's the lecture about tonight. Okay, so this guy is behind the kinetic theory. His name is Boltzmann or Boltzmann. This guy is Austrian. Something about this guy, which is interesting. He, this is the guy who introduced the theory of atoms and molecules into thermodynamics. He said, hey, if you make the assumption that these little particles exist. You can explain just about anything and everything regarding thermodynamics. You can explain the pressure. You can explain the temperature. You can explain the fact that the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules, blah, blah, blah. Except there was a problem. The problem was most physicists and chemists at the time, this is the turn of, turn of the 20th century or late 19th century, most of the physicists believed that the atoms and molecules were mathematical constructs. No one was willing to believe in the existence of these molecules or the existence of these atoms okay they said okay you know just as long as they're on paper as long as the numbers work out you know if they thought that this were more of a mathematical trickery all right so boltzmann ended up developing the kinetic theory of gases and then he gave us the perspective that you can explain just about anything regarding thermodynamics by assuming that they were real particles like the atoms and the molecules and obviously his colleagues kind of shot him because of that and then eventually he got so depressed then he hanged himself, all right? That's, that's what it seems. And no pun intended, if he just hung around a little bit longer without hanging himself, more than likely he would have won the Nobel Prize in physics. All right, he ended up hanging himself in 1903 or something, and then Einstein comes along in 1905, and he, for his PhD dissertation, he says, okay, so he proves the existence of atoms and molecules in essence, and then his PhD dissertation was the size of the molecules. All right, so because of Einstein's work, the, the, the existence of atoms and molecules gained acceptance. All right, so kinetic energy of gases that you're looking at. So you're dealing with temperature, so the temperature is going to be the measure of atoms and molecules. All right, so we're still doing a bit of a review. And then we know that the, the higher the temperature is, the faster the molecules are moving, the higher the pressure is going to be. So think of it in terms of tire pressure, right? So if you put the heat into the tires, if you heat up the tires more like it, the pressure is going to go up because the molecules are moving faster. If you cool the tire down, the molecules will start to slow down. The pressure is going to go down. So eventually, you know that there is a region where the pressure is going to become extremely low. At some point, in theory, it could become zero. So the pressure is going to become zero, which means that you're not going to have any pressure at negative 273.15 Celsius. So Lord Kelvin takes a look at that. He says, OK, so let's come up with a different scale. And then let's make this zero Kelvin. All right, so Kelvin scale is all about expressing pressure 
in terms of the the, the motion of the molecules in essence. So the challenge is immediately after the explosion, engineers focus their attention on the solid rocket boosters and the right booster in particular. The commission of inquiry quickly went down the same route. When the solid motors were fired on the launch pad, you can see in the film there's a puff of smoke through one of the joints. It happens to be in the coldest part of the solid rocket motor, the bit that was in the shadow and hadn't seen the sun. And you can see that at the start. And as the flight progresses, you can see a flame develop from that initial puff of smoke. And that flame eventually cuts into the hydrogen tank, almost like an oxy-second cutter cutting into the tank. It was finding the fuel tank, which was full of liquid hydrogen, that caused the main explosion. This was the message from telemetry data and from the video evidence. The video also clearly showed the crew capsule plunging towards the Earth. Experts are still divided, but the crew may well have survived the explosion, only to be killed when their capsule crashed into the sea with terrifying force. Okay, so... Almost immediately after the explosion... I used to teach this. The crew did survive the initial explosion. It must have been about 10 Gs, no more than that, maybe about 15, but it wasn't deadly. And there are recordings of these people talking to each other. It was still intact. And then we've run the calculations. I think the impact with the ocean was um, a little bit over 100 G, so that was not survivable. So these people didn't suffer any pain. So, so the question is what caused The reality them? was that the flight was doomed from liftoff. There was a fundamental flaw in the design of the shuttle solid rocket motors. Uh, this flaw uh, started a chain of events very soon after liftoff that led to the loss of the vehicle and the loss of the lives of the crew. The particular aspect of the booster design which was causing most concern was the rubber O-rings, the strips between the rocket segments. The O-rings form a vital part of the shuttle's protection. Hot, burning gases fill the insides of the solid rocket boosters. To stop these seeping out through the joints connecting the segments, there are two barriers. The first is a sort of asbestos putty. Next come the O-rings, two rubber seals which go round the circumference of the rocket, sealing the joint like the thin rubber rings around the inside of a jam jar lid. The ice suddenly became more significant, as Feynman dramatically explained. Feynman had got this uh, ordinary clear glass of water with ice cubes in it, and a piece of O-ring material, which he'd had in during this recess. For a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance for our problem. That was a, a physics teacher, a physics prof, Nobel Prize winner, actually bringing a bit of school physics into it, showing, look, here's a demonstration, this is what happens to an O-ring. If you cooled it down, then it's not compressible, then it won't seat, and gases will go through. Now the floodgates had opened. It became apparent that there was a history of problems with the O-rings on the shuttle, a history which once again had been carefully kept from the so-called decision makers. This history included previous examples of erosion of the O-rings, and even worse, connections between O-ring trouble and extra cold weather. Engineers had vigorously flagged warnings at the Morton Thiokol site. They described what's called a criticality factor, which could eventually lead to loss of life. Their warnings were pushed aside by their own bosses and NASA management. Waivers had been issued to let... All right, so Feynman was the guy who... The reality was that the flight was... Kind of solved the problem, in a sense, but he got a lot of hints here and there because a lot of the engineers didn't want to come forward after the disaster because they didn't want to lose their jobs. And while they were talking to Feynman, they would just hint at this and that. Eventually, Feynman was able to put two empty together and he said, oh, so that's what's happening. So as the temperature starts to go down, all rings were not as functional. So they become much more rigid, right? So that's, that's what caused the disaster. So they connect the area of gases. It's kind of interesting, okay, in a sense that we kind of came up with a conceptual explanation for it. And our conceptual explanation goes, let me check to see if I have the basic explanation first before I do the derivation for it. Okay, so evidently I'm going to jump into the derivation. I'm not sure if I want to do the derivation as yet. All right, so I'll just do a simple uh, explanation for us first. Okay, so here's what's happening. When you heat something up, the molecules are going to start to move faster. Their kinetic energies will go up. And as a result, the pressure inside is going to build up. Okay, so that's the way we were looking at it. We were looking at it from the perspective of car tires. Okay, so the tires are heated which means that the heat is going to go into the kinetic energy of the molecules, so the molecules are moving faster. As a result, the temperature goes up. As a result, the pressure goes up. Okay, so we, I worked on grasping the concepts intuitively first, instead of doing what most instructors do traditionally. They just dive into uh, physics using formulas and whatever they can grab from the books. I usually make sure that you guys have an intuitive understanding of it. So let's talk about the kinetic energy of gases. Number one, the average kinetic energy of the gas is going to be the measure of temperature, right? There you go. So all of a sudden, you end up coming up with two formulas. This formula you guys recognize, all right? So that's the standard kinetic energy formula. 
RMS value, that means root mean squared, or you could say that's the average, uh, the average speed squared. Let's go along with that. That means a little bit more than that, but let's go along with that. All right, so the kinetic energy, the temperature is the measure of average kinetic energy of the molecules. So all of a sudden we come up with two formulas representing kinetic energy. Okay, so we know what mass is, we know what the speed is. Okay, so this represents the Kelvin temperature that we've seen before. And there's a lowercase k here that we kind of mentioned before, but we didn't really emphasize it. All right, so this k is known as Boltzmann's constant in honor of Boltzmann. All right, so if you see a bar like that, that represents the average kinetic energy. You're looking at the average kinetic energy of the molecule, so you know M is the mass. All right, so this RMS speed is the average speed, but this is a non-zero average speed. We call it the root mean square speed. So it's going to be expressed in terms of meters per second. So K is in honor of Boltzmann, so that's the Boltzmann's constant. All right, so it's a very small number, 1.2, 1.38 times 10 to minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Okay, the only thing that you need to know in this formula, just forget the math for now. Okay, so how much this agrees with the definition? of temperature. So the temperature is, which is this, temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So if you're measuring the temperature, you're measuring the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So that gives you some idea of how fast the molecules are moving within the system. So temperature is the Kelvin temperature within that scale. All right, and then we talked about internal energy. So internal energy is the mechanical energy of the molecules. So it's kinetic plus potential energy of the molecules. All right, so internal energy at the level that the physics books are written for um, fundamentals of physics or university physics that you guys are taking is usually expressed like this. All right, so U represents the internal energy. It's gonna be a combination of kinetic and potential energies. All right, so we're dealing with ideal gases for now. If you're dealing with ideal gases, the ideal gases, it's an approximation, so they're not gonna have any potential energies because potential energy is related to the relative position of particles provided that there's some kind of a conservative force acting between the particles, like the electrostatic force or gravitational force or whatever. Ideal gas in the ideal gas law, we assume that there are no forces acting among these molecules. If there are any forces, those are the forces of collisions. And you're dealing with a low density gas, you're dealing with point particles, the, the sizeless point particles. So in essence, the ideal gases are um, they don't collide with each other. The molecules don't even collide with each other on, in this system. So if that's the case, the internal energy of the ideal gas is going to be all kinetic. So that's what it means. All right. So this is the total energy of an ideal gas that you're looking at. So this is the total internal energy of an ideal gas is gonna be represented by this one. So it's gonna be three house and KT. Uh, so this is, or you can express it in terms of NR, remember what N is, that's the total number of moles. R is the, um, the ideal gas constant. <clears throat> and then what else? The capital N represents the number of molecules that you have, total number of molecules that you have. Okay, so this becomes the total internal energy formula without a derivation. All right, so kinetic energy is going to be proportional to speed. Potential energy is going to be related to position. Okay, so that's what I say, but because it's an ideal gas and because it involves no conservative forces, the ideal gas molecules will not have any potential energy. So this is the formula that we will get to use. <coughs> use other standard formulas. All right, so what else do we have? All right, what else do we have? Okay, guys. Um, okay, now hold on to your brains. I'm about to do a derivation. The details of the derivation, just try to keep up with that. I'm going to tell you what's important and what's not at the end of it. Okay, because this is not something that I want to do just using mathematical models. This is something that requires a little bit of a derivation at this point. Okay, we will have more of these in physics too, because I prefer to do mathematical models, but sometimes you need to know where these formulas are coming from, okay? So at this level, no one is gonna require you to do the derivations, but how do we know that this formula is correct? At least this side of it, I understand if there's no potential energy. So this is the average kinetic energy of the molecules, and then you got this many molecules, so that's gonna give you the total internal energy of the system. So the question is, how do we know that the, the portion of the formula that has the temperature in it is also gonna give you the total internal energy of the system? So how does that magic happen? Okay, so, what I'm about to do is, if you're a physicist, you, you, this is the reason why you wake up in the morning, okay? If you're a physicist, this is kind of sick. I got to share the secret with you. This is the stuff that you get excited about, not the stuff that I'm lecturing, okay? The stuff that I'm lecturing about, I break it down. I give you mathematical models. We watch videos, this and that. I try to make it more relevant. I try to build up your intuition. And when I do that, believe it or not, I understand it better as well, okay? The understanding happens usually when you explain it. 
Okay, that's the reason why I kind of force you guys to explain stuff. You cannot explain something that you don't understand. Just because you can do the math doesn't mean that you understand it. But to do it mathematically also gives you a different sort of understanding. So that's what I want to share with you right now. I'm going to do a derivation from one of my favorite books. It's Halliday and Resnick. Okay, so when I was a physics major, Halliday and Resnick was the Bible of physics. For physics majors, we had to take Halliday and Resnick. And they, for engineering majors, they had an easier version of Halliday and Resnick. And so physics majors used to, used to take a higher, slightly higher level than the engineering majors. Today, just they got rid of that nonsense. Okay, physics, engineering, it doesn't matter. Everybody takes the same step. All right, so I got this derivation from Halliday and Resnick. So I'm just going to step you through it. And then I'm going to make it sound like this makes perfect sense. And then I'm going to go back and then I'm going to pick at it for a while. Okay, so what do we know? So focus on this particle inside the box. Okay, so you got this box. So you, no, no taking it's necessary. Just, just listen to it. There's a bit of a story behind it. Okay. So this is the particle that we're looking at. So notice that this particle is moving back and forth, back and forth. You got the dimensions of the box. All right, so the height is L, the width is, the width is L, L, and the all three dimensions is going to be L in essence. So it's going to be L cubed that you're looking at. So there's a force acting on the particle. All right, so as a result, the particle is accelerating in this direction. Okay. Now, when somebody makes a statement like that, my, my first reaction is, what force is acting on the particle? There's no force acting on the particle. If you're looking at the particle here, it's moving in a straight line, and the force is going to be acting on the particle on the, only when the particle is hitting the wall. All right, so I have to explain that. So, which means that this particle is going to accelerate while it's impacting the wall. All right, so there's an acceleration. Okay, so the definition of acceleration is how fast the velocity changes in time. Okay, so we end up using the cap definition of it in this case. All right, so all of a sudden I'm able to express the force. So, evidently, this is the force acting on the mass while it's changing direction. So it's colliding with the wall. It's going to accelerate. All right. And, and then I love these derivations. So you know dv is the change in velocity. All right? the dt is the time uh, within the duration. So I, instead of using calculus, I go, OK, let's just change it a little bit because I want to do something with it. And so I'm expressing the force. So this is the amount of force which is going to be acting on the particle when the, the, the mass is colliding with the wall. OK, so boom, boom, boom. All right. And then we know a couple of things about this. There's not going to be any change in speed, but velocity is going to change. All right, so velocity is going to change in the sense that the direction is going to change. So the final speed is going to be the same as the initial speed, except uh, the final speed is going to be moving in the opposite direction of the initial speed. Okay, I go, okay, so let's factor that in to this. All right, and, 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 then, and then this is going to enough. Okay, so what am I missing here? Okay, I'm missing two here, so there's a negative here. All right, so this initial velocity that we're looking at, is there's no change in velocity, all right? So this is the velocity for the mass to travel. Okay, so evidently I'm gonna go after t, which is fine. All right, so here's the initial velocity. All right, so this initial velocity can be expressed because it's gonna remain constant within the box. Okay, so this is the amount of time it's gonna take for the particle to travel twice the length of this uh, box in essence. So I get the T out of this one and do a by substitution in there. All right. And then at this point, I noticed that I got two, two, so they will cancel. So denominator of a denominator is a numerator. So I'm going to pull that back up. And I'm almost done. This is so cute. Okay. So I say, okay, I'm almost done. I like this formula. So this is the force acting on the single particle during the collision. All right, so this is the action force acting on the particle exerted by the wall. So, which means that the reaction force is going to be acting on the wall. All right, so the reaction force is the force that the particle is going to be exerting on the wall, which is going to be responsible for the pressure. So, the only thing I have to do is just get rid of this negative. So, this is the force exerted by the particle on the wall. Okay, so we can express this force in terms of the amount of pressure that it's going to cause. You know that the force divided by area is going to be pressure. But before I do that, I say, OK, I'm going to express this force in terms of kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. All right, so I'm going to divide and multiply the numerator by 2. All right, so this is my kinetic energy expression. So this gives us the average kinetic energy. <clears throat> OK, guys, those of you guys who want a major in physics, this is the sort of stuff that you're going to be doing for year after year after year. So if you don't enjoy this sort of stuff, don't major in physics. <laughs> it's, it's not too much. You learn to love it at some point. Except I'm about to point out something which is going to be disappointing at some point. So force 
Okay, so this is the amount of force generated by one single particle, right? So this is the force acting on a certain amount of area. So this is the force that's going to be responsible for pressure. And area of a single wall is going to be L2, so we'll express it. And then we'll do a back substitution. But no, we're not going to do a back substitution. So we will express this in terms of the pressure. So this is the force divided by the area, which is going to be L2. It's going to give us the pressure created by a single particle on that wall. Notice that this is the volume right now because L times L squared is going to be the volume of, of this cube. All right, so this is L cubed is the volume. So the pressure exerted on the wall by a single particle is going to be this. So we came up with one single particle. <clears throat> but now you got to remember that you got a bunch of particles. We got a large number of particles. In fact, we got n number of particles in this one. So let's take a look at the total pressure generated by the total number of particles that we got. So which, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by n. So that's going to give us the total pressure. All right, so this is the total number of particles that we got. OK, so one thing that we need to remember is these particles are free to move along three dimensions. They're not just moving like back and forth on the horizontal. They are moving at random directions. So they are free to move in three dimensions. So what we need to do is we need to get the total number of particles and that only one third of these particles randomly move along the horizontal. All right, so along the horizontal direction, if the particles are free to move three dimensionally, randomly one third of them will be moving along the x direction, along the horizontal direction. Okay, so as a result, if you're looking at the pressure on one single wall that you're looking at along the horizontal walls, it's gonna be n divided by three. Notice that there are a lot of assumptions that go into coming up with these formulas. All right, so what else do we need? All right, so <clears throat> remember this formula for ideal gas law. This is PV equals NKT. All right, so it's a good time to utilize this formula. So we'll do a back substitution. We get to use NKT on the left-hand side. All of a sudden, you got this relationship between the kinetic energy and the temperature. All right, so now it's solving for the average kinetic energy of the molecules. I, that's what I was going to do. And then when you solve for the average kinetic energy of the molecules, this is the expression that you come up with. All right, so it's going to be three halves kT. So this was the original formula that we saw. All right, so here's the average kinetic energy of the particles expressed in terms of the temperature. And then we end up recovering the formula very nicely. We're not done yet. OK, so I'm moving forward. Now let's take a look at the internal energy, which is going to be a combination of kinetic and potential energies. OK, so no potential energies to speak up because of the simple reason that this is an ideal gas. No conservative forces acting between the particles. So you take the kinetic energy of a single particle. Obviously, you got n of them. So when you multiply them together, that's going to give you the internal energy of the system. All right, so both sides of the formula is going to get multiplied. So once again, you got NKT can be expressed in terms of NRT as well. So that's going to give us a second formula for them. Okay, so this becomes the internal energy of a system. So these are the formulas. Okay, so it's funny because as a freshman, you're taking physics. And as a freshman, when I was taking physics, I was really impressed with this part. But when I was actually doing the derivation, I, when I started lecturing at this level, I went back to my book. I used to use this book as my main source for the derivations. And all of a sudden, when you become more sophisticated at physics, all of a sudden you go, oh, this is horrible. Okay, the book makes some assumptions which are not really justified. Okay, so we'll discuss that next time. Because there's a better derivation which is coming up. I'll point out the sort of bridges that I was selling you guys that you were, you were buying. Okay, so now take a look at this. This RMS represents the average speed, root mean square speed of the particles. And how fast the particles move depends on the temperature, obviously. So you got the number of molecules. All right, so the all right, so you got the number of molecules, and this represents the speed as you increase the temperature. So at 300 degree Kelvin, 300 Kelvin, this is how fast the molecules are moving. This is the average speed. So which means that some of the molecules are moving slower, some of the mo molecules are moving faster than this. Okay, at 300 Kelvin, but the average, the peak, is right here. That's the reason why this is known as the RMS speed. When you increase the temperature, the average speed of the molecules will go up. Okay, so their average kinetic energies go up. So which means that their RMS speeds will go up. Okay, so it doesn't mean that all the particles are moving at the speed. It just simply means that the, 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 most of the particles are moving at that speed. This looks like a bell-shaped curve. So I'd say like 68% of the molecules were, are gonna be moving about one standard deviation of the mean. So that's what it means. So they're moving faster. All right, so that's the meaning of it. Okay, so let me just check to see something. Okay, this is good enough.
All right, now here's, do I wanna do that or, because it's gonna be too much right now. All right, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna take it from here. Now that I gave you a really good definition, I gave you a derivation of it. Next time what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna tell you what it is that is wrong with the derivation. Okay, so this is, and how to fix it. Okay, I want you to get a really good understanding of, because whenever you're watching someone do a derivation like that, I want you to go, oh, from a conceptual perspective, none of you guys ask a few questions. Let me just point out a few things. And then I will just pick it apart. All right, so when I was giving you a derivation of this one, all right, I did a few things that should have raised alarms and somehow the physics books kind of get away with this at this level. And the stuff that you should have, should have said something about, so I'm just gonna go real fast sideways. All right, this is not the one. Okay, so this one. Okay, guys, I kind of mentioned that the initial speed and the final speeds are the same, and the velocity just changed direction. Okay, so I didn't really justify it. I said because they, they're the same, I was able to proceed with the mathematics. Okay, so how would I know that they're the same? The thing that really bugged me the most about this derivation, I, I didn't know how to even overcome that problem, was. There's an assumption here, which is just so wrong in essence, it bugged the hell out of me for years. This time that you're looking at, this is the collision time, right? And this time is the time related to speed. They are not the same. Good job, this was dumb. I'm in the lecture without recording it. I need to recording of it. All right. All right, so problem number two. Um, we got the Goodyear blimp. The volume is given. And the temperature temperature and pressure is given. So the internal energy of helium in this case. So what we need, the volume is given. Temperature is given. The pressure is given. Incorrect units. So what's the internal energy? All right, so internal energy is going to be the kinetic energy for n number of particles or Avogadro's number of particles that we got in terms of the n moles of particles. All right, so what do we know? Um, we got everything here. We got the temperature, which is good. Either we will get to use r or n, r or k, those are the constants, so that's fine. The only thing which is missing is we don't know what n is, look, number of particles or number of moles of particles. Okay, so the question is, how do we figure that out? Okay. We will make the assumption that this is an ideal gas. All right, so if you make the assumption that it's an ideal gas, then obviously it's straightforward. So this NRT is gonna be the same as PV, all right? And so if it's PV, we know what the pressure is, we know what the volume is. And also this NRT is gonna turn into a PV. Okay, I didn't have to do that. I'm surprised. I should have just substituted this in there, but hey, that's fine. Sometimes you see it while you're lecturing. Instead of doing all this stuff, only thing I had to do is just take this NRT and then substitute PV in its place, and that would have been it. And then plug the numbers in. All right, so the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy, right? Okay, so you got gas here. You're heating it up. So what happens? Molecules become energized, so which means that the amount of heat you put in is going to go into the internal energy of the molecules, meaning that it's going to, it's going to go into the kinetic energy of the molecules. So the internal energy goes up when you heat it up. Notice that there is a piston here, so its piston is going to go up. It's going to expand. So this expanding gas is going to do work on this piston. So which means that the internal energy is going to go down by the amount of work that this gas performs on the piston by expanding. The internal energy of the system is going to go down. All right. So internal energy goes up by the amount of heat that you put into the system, and then the internal energy is going to go down by the amount of work done by the system by through an expansion process. So that's known as the first law of thermodynamics, otherwise known as the conservation, that's otherwise known as the conservation of energy principle. So he goes into the system, so the system becomes energized. And then when this system is allowed to do work by expanding, the internal energy of the system goes, goes down. Or differently, all right, so you can, 
heat up the system so the internal energy of the gas is going to go up and then you can also squeeze but you can do work on the system by squeezing it by applying pressure on it as a result the molecules are going to move faster so the heat is going to increase the internal energy of the system the amount of work that you do on the system is also going to increase the internal energy of the system so when you have a piston when this piston compresses the air within it's air is going to heat up which means that the molecules are going to be moving faster as a result so molecules will become more energized temperature of the air is going to go up, which means that the average kinetic energy of the molecules will go up. So the first law of thermodynamics, the internal energy goes up by the amount of heat that goes into the system. The internal energy goes down by the amount of work done by the system. All right, so you combine them into a single statement. This becomes the first law, the conservation of energy principle. All right, so delta U is the change in internal energy. Obviously, Q represents CW's work. Everything is in terms of joules. And so this is the first law of thermodynamics. It says derivation. Okay, let's go along with the derivation. It's fine. Okay, so it's the same as before. All right, so internal energy is going gonna, is gonna to increase by the amount of heat that you put into the system. It's going to go down by the amount of work done by the system by expanding. And it, so you will combine them into a single statement. Okay, so work means obviously uh, force causing displacement if there is force responsible for displacement in this case. It's known as work. And this is the amount of heat that goes into the system. Okay, that could be expressed using this formula. You're in essence heating up the air. Temperature of the air is gonna go up. You can express it in terms of the mass or you can express it in terms of total number of moles or you can express it in terms of L. Uh, that's gonna represent the uh, amount of heat that goes in or comes out of the potential energy of the molecules doing a phase transition, so that's your latent heat. So heat could be any one of these. You can use any one of those formulas for that purpose. All right, so let's unpack the work statement here. So what is work in terms of an expanding piston? So obviously there's force acting on the piston in this direction, which is gonna cause the expansion of the volume. All right, so there is force, which is gonna be expressed in terms of the pressure that it's gonna generate because this force is acting on the area of the piston. All right, so we'll express the force in terms of pressure. So by dividing this side and the other side, um, divide, multiplying and dividing the right-hand side by the area. So ds is going to represent the displacement of the piston in the upper direction. So the displacement of the piston in the upper direction times the area that you're looking at is going to be the volume. So that's going to represent the change in volume. So this pressure is going to cause this much change in volume. So that's the amount of work. So the amount of work done by the expanding gas can be expressed in terms of pressure and the change in volume that pressure causes. All right, so that's the formula that we use in this. So we will have to unpack that statement and then we will have to build on. All right, so first law of thermodynamics, we discussed that. Um, we are always taught dealing with an ideal gas of some sort. We heat it up, the molecules will be moving faster so they will have large expanded energies. So what that means is their internal energy is gonna go up. And if this gas expands by doing work on something, while well, it's expanding, if it's pushing up against something, causing a change in volume, by the amount of work done by this expanding air, the internal energy is gonna go down. Yeah. This takes us into the second law, which is an extension of the first law. Okay. Heat is a form of energy that flows from hot to cold. And because it is a form of energy, it's got the capacity to do work. Energy means capacity to do work. What that means is that you can't apply a force on something to make that something move. The force can cause motion. So if there's heat, you can you can get useful work out of it. You can extract useful work out of it. All right, so according to the second law, heat is a form of energy that flows from hot to cold. Because it's energy, you can, you can extract useful work out of it. And for you to be able to convert this heat, some of that heat into useful work, requires you to have an engine, which is known as a heat engine. Engines are engines that work on this principle. Brent Van Arsdell manufactures small demonstration engines that show off the unique capabilities of Reverend Sterling's invention. One of the engines runs on the hot air from a cup of coffee. But surprisingly, it also runs on the cold air from a bowl of ice. All it needs is a temperature difference to make it run. All you gotta do is keep one side hot and the other side cold. You can do that any place that you can keep the temperature difference, these things will run. This Sterling engine can run on the heat from the palm of your hand. 
All right, so that's the heat. Corinthian orange doll manufactures small. Look, if there's any temperature difference, there's heat flow. Heat flows from hot to cold. Thermodynamics is something fascinating if you think about it. All right. You literally, if there's heat flow, once you figure that that's energy, why not just convert it into useful work? Energy means capacity to do work. This heat already has got the capacity to do work. All right, so the question becomes, and this is, this is going to sound like a really, really smart question, despite the fact that once you get the hang of it, you will go, that, that's a really dumb question. It is a real dumb question in reality, but I'm going to make it sound really smart. When you get better at it, you go, oh, but that's, that's why didn't you even talk about it? Look, this guy, I got my coffee, for example, right? So coffee is going to be hotter than the inside of the car. So there's going to be heat flow from hot to cold until there's a common temperature. Notice that these guys are creating a very small temperature difference, but he's creating a very small temperature difference. This is hot. The room is going to be cooler than this, obviously. So there's a heat flow, and they're getting a sterling engine. And notice that it just, the fan starts to run. So why can't I do the same using my car? Okay, so that's my dumb question for you. All right, why can't I do the same thing? And why am I paying so much money uh, at the gas pump? Okay, if it's that simple, why can't I drink my coffee and drive my car at the same time? It's almost like a Tesla-like idea. <laughs> they can't do that because of the simple reason that coffee is expensive if you're getting it from Starbucks and gas is cheaper. So what's the main reason for it? Main reason is, number one, this is exactly, this is exactly how your car engine works as well, except if you're trying to run your car by using the temperature difference between the coffee and the inside of the car, the amount of heat that flows is not large enough to drive your car, guys. The temperature difference needs to be much, much higher. And then the gas that your engine is burning actually gets the temperatures up to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever. And then uh, there's a large enough temperature difference between the engine and outside. So if you're able to generate a large enough heat flow, that can be converted into work normally. Well, right, you, so can see, you can see that with his demonstration there. The, the, the uh, fan didn't start turning until he uh, flipped the, the propeller on it. It yeah. Couldn't overcome the, the inertia. Oh, man, David, give yourself 20 points. You, you, what you're saying is just right on the money. In fact, the temperature difference is so low, which is known as the efficiency of a system, that unless this guy literally flipped the fan by pushing it, it was not going to work. You're absolutely right. Because when I'm lecturing about this to art students, it's, they don't really understand. They don't, they think that this is something revolutionary. No, it's not. Your car engine works on the same principle, except you need to have a large enough temperature difference. All right, now, this is the sort of stuff. Thermodynamics requires that you spend a lot of time thinking about this sort of stuff. And I gotta tell you, the first time I took thermal, I didn't really appreciate it that much. I think this is kind of like wine as you get older, <laughs> you like it better. Or the wine gets older, it tastes better. Thermal is kind of like the same sort of stuff. This takes a little bit getting used to because now we will just get into all these weird, like you got isobaric expansion, you got isothermal expansion, you got the terminology. So just bear with me eventually. I mean, not everything is gonna make sense this time around, but when you start to take the advanced course, I want you to be able to refer back to this and say, oh, so we've seen this, now they're building up. Okay, so that's the reason why recording of these lectures are important because of the simple reason that you can always, you guys know where to find this stuff online. All right, so before taking the more advanced courses, you can review this stuff. Okay, John Capacitors, usually. Okay, I'll take a look at those comments. You guys are making interesting comments, I'm just not, okay. All right, capacitors have to do, oh, is that, yeah, you're right about the capacitors. You first have 10 points with them. They used to turn the cranks by hand, Reagan, like, I, I don't know, um, 50, 60 years ago. I think they, I, 60 years, maybe, maybe longer than that. Okay, so they have to just crank it up a little bit. But with, with capacitors, you need those if your system's not um, stout enough to start the motor. But if right, you got right, right. enough energy in it, then right. you can start. Okay. So, guys, we'll talk about capacitors next semester. But it sounds like some of you guys have hands-on ex experience. So that's only going to help making the lectures a little bit more interesting. That stuff is also interesting. Anyway, so <clears throat> this one is kind of neat. So iso iso isobaric means constant pressure. So whatever you do, the pressure inside is going to remain constant. Okay, so when you heat it up, the only way the pressure is going to be constant is this thing is allowed to expand. So notice that the pressure is constant and the volume is expanding. So this is known as isobaric. Okay, so straightforward. It's not that complicated. Okay, so how would that influence the first law, which is, remember, the internal energy is going to go up by the amount of heat that you put in, and then the internal energy goes down by the amount of uh, work done by the system. Okay, so 
pressure is constant, volume is expanding. So what happens to the internal energy? Okay, so obviously the work is being done. The only way the volume is expanding is because it's pushing up against the boundary and moving the boundary by changing the volume, right? So, which means that this is the formula that we will get to use. Okay, so at this point, sometimes I'm undecisive. I use algebra, sometimes I will switch the calculus. I will go back to algebra. I like algebra in my presentations because you can get to the truth of what I'm trying to say by using simplified formulas and then switch the calculus sometimes because calculus will give you more detail. So just, I got a really unique method, obviously, as you guys are realizing it, it just depends on the sophistication of what I'm trying to say. I'll switch back and forth, okay? A lot of the university physics books, obviously we use calculus at this point, okay, just because for, sometimes it is easier to get to the expression or the concept if you're using algebra, because algebra is a little bit more, it's an easier mathematical expression that summarizes uh, the truth of what we were trying to get to. Man, I should become a poet at some point. I just, this stuff that I'm trying to say is, is, is sometimes it's easier to express things algebraically than using calculus. Okay, so notice that you could go from here to there, all of a sudden it turns into algebra. This is calculus. The volume is changing from initial to final, and then it just simply means that the constant pressure, the volume is changing. And then it turns into an algebraic statement one more time. All right, and more advanced courses will be in calculus, but like I said, I do transition back and forth. All right, so this represents the change in volume. This represents the work done by the system by gas expanding and pushing the boundary, changing the volume of the boundary. Okay, so now let's massage this term a little bit, the Q. All right, so this is the heat that you're feeding into the system. All right, so what's happening is by this amount of work, this <coughs> by the amount of heat that you're feeding into the system, the temperature is going up. So the temperature of the gas is going up and obviously the gas is gonna have a heat constant, specific heat constant. So remember, specific heat constant represents the resistance to change in temperature, so it depends on the substance. And it's got this many moles of molecules inside. Instead of using this, we could also use this expression, which is the mass of the gas that you're looking at. So all of a sudden we got these options. So depending upon the problem, you could use this for heat or you can use that for heat. So this is gonna be the mass of the substance that we are trying to heat up. Um, and that's it. So all of a sudden we came up with a generalized expression for the change in internal energy of an ideal gas in this case, doing an isobaric expansion, so constant pressure expansion. All right, uh, problems are not that difficult, except uh, obviously you have to kind of keep track of the concepts. Okay, so what do we have in this case? Oh, instead of gas, now we've got water placed inside the cylinder. All right, so this is the mass of the water. They, there is a constant pressure which is being maintained inside. So the pressure is going to be constant, so it's an isobaric case. So the water temperature is raised by 31 degrees, so it's going to go up. Okay, so in one case, the water is going to be in the liquid phase, and that's going to expand by a small amount, so we get that. And then, okay, now you turn the water into gas phase, so now it's, it's a vapor, and it's going to expand a lot more. So now let's take a look at the work done in each case, and then the change in internal energy. All right, so it's the same amount of water, it's got a constant pressure. One thing we do is we increase the temperature. As a result, there's gonna be a change in volume. So the volume is gonna change a little bit in the liquid phase, it's gonna change a lot more in the gas phase. So what is the amount of work done in the change in internal energy? And then this will require a little bit of a discussion at the end. Okay, I, like I always say, when you do the problem at the end, look at the numbers and then check to see if there's anything that you can get out of these numbers, which means that we will have to, there's, at the end of it, there's always an interpretation. Like there has to be some kind of a conceptual conclusion that should either make sense or you go, okay, I messed something up. So this is the, amount, this is the mass of the water, it's one gram. All right, so if there's a constant pressure inside, we're changing the temperature by this amount, expressed in terms of Celsius. In, in the case of liquid, there's gonna be a change in volume. This is the amount of change. In the case of gas, the change in volume is going to be much larger, like a thousand times larger in this case. This is 10 to the 8, this is 10 to the 5th. All right, so the amount of work done during the expansion process and the change in internal energy of the substance, in this case, is water. All right, so the work done is pressure causing change in volume, in this case. Liquid, the gas, all right, so the amount of work done by the gas is huge. Oh, my God. So as long as the stuff in the... I was gonna say tank is inside the piston is in the gas form. Notice that it undergoes a much, much larger 
it's able to do much more work. It's, it's able to generate, it's able to transfer a lot more energy in the gas form than in the liquid form. That's what it means. So this is a useful information. So what happens to the change in energy in this case of the liquid versus gas? All right, so here's the formula that we will get to use for this case. There's no phase transitions. Uh, so th there's gonna be a temperature change for water or gas either way. All right, so especially your capacity for water is this. I think it's going to be the same in both cases. All right, specific capacity for water, whether it's in the liquid form or gas form, it's going to be the same, it looks like. All right, so internal energy of the water is going to change a lot more in the liquid case than in the gas case. All right, so what the so energy of the water is going to change a lot more. All right, so. Okay, so let's go for an explanation for this one. This one was weird. Change in internal energy. All right. Um, okay, in both cases, the amount of heat that goes into the system has to be the same if this thing is the same. And except the amount of work done by gas is a lot more than the amount of work done by liquid water. So um, the change in internal energy thing does not make sense. Something is off with this problem. Okay, so in the liquid case, I would expect the internal energy to change a lot more than this in the gas case, and it doesn't appear. So something is off with this problem. I don't know what it is. Just see the reason why it's important to actually think about what's going on. Um, work done by the gas is gonna be a lot more because the, there's a much bigger expansion in volume. If the amount of heat that goes into the system is the same in both cases, and it would be the same if C is the same. So the change in internal energy has to be much larger. I'm guessing that this is probably gas and this is the liquid. I think I probably transpose there. Okay, so this was an interesting learning experience. Okay, like I said, the, the selector is still work in progress. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. This is problem number four. Okay, let's check to see what that says. So this time we got this amount of water. So the one kilogram of water at 100 degrees. So it gets converted into steam. It's being boiled at a standard pressure. So which means that, okay, this means that the pressure is gonna remain constant. All right, so when the water turns into steam, the volume is gonna change. So it goes from this value to that volume. Okay, so there's a bit of, quite a bit of an expansion. The volume goes up like a thousand times. So how much work done by the system during this process? So the amount of work done during this phase transition. So that's what we're working on. And then how much heat must be added to the system during the process? And then what's the change in the internal energy of the system during the boiling process? So how much heat? All right, let's just take a look at this. I'm just curious. So one kilogram of water. Okay, so this is the boiling temperature. So it's going to remain constant. All right, so uh, this is for the liquid water, and then it turns into steam, so there's going to be a change in volume. All right, so during this expansion process, how much work is being done? Uh, volume changes. Okay, so I, I assume that this has to be inside a container when the volume is changing, so that should represent the amount of work. So how much heat needs to be added into the system? And lastly, the change in the internal energy of the system. It's the, it's the constant pressure, that's the atmospheric pressure in terms of Pascal. All right, so a change in volume, a constant pressure. All right, so this is the amount of work which is required. All right, all right so while well, the volume is changing. And so this is the amount of heat that's gonna be responsible for the phase change. All right, so that's the latent heat. The mass is given already, so you plug the numbers in. And here's the change in internal energy. So this minus that is gonna represent the change in internal energy. So, which means that, all right, so there's more heat that goes into the system than the amount of work being done, which means that the difference is gonna go into the internal energy of the molecule. So molecules will be moving faster. Ooh. No. Okay, I said something wrong. Okay.
Okay, I said something completely wrong, and I'm not sure if anybody actually caught on. Okay, so what's happening is, look, this is the amount of heat that goes into the system. And this is the amount of work that the system performs. Obviously, it's an expanding gas. It's, it's expanding. It's taking up space. It's pushing up against some other air mass somewhere. So this is the heat that you put into the system. So the water is boiling and it's expanding. And then the water molecules are becoming more, the water vapor molecules, water molecules are becoming more energized. So this is the amount of energy that the water molecules gain. I, and I said, oh, so this goes into the motion of the molecules, which means that the molecules are moving faster. Okay. How many of you guys noticed that that statement is not correct? And how many of you guys tell me why that statement is not correct? The final statement. Okay, so not a single person has yet realized that what I said is complete BS, which is good. So <laughs> let's move on if that's the case. So now that you guys are here to buy a bridge, let me just paint the bridge a little bit more. Let me make it a little bit more expensive for you guys. What I said is completely false. My final statement is completely false. Everything else is correct. I analyze it. I say, hey, this is the amount of work that the water molecules undergo during a phase transition, which means that they will turn into gas, they will expand, they will push the air mass out of the way. So they're doing work in expanding. And this is the amount of heat that I have to feed into the system in order to turn water into gas. And so the difference goes into the internal energy of the molecules and make the assumption that the internal energy of the molecules is just kinetic energy. And that's completely wrong. Okay, the reason why that statement is completely wrong is because it's happening at constant temperature, guys. Temperature represents the kinetic energy of the molecules. There's no change in temperature. So this is the amount of energy that goes into the potential energy of the molecules, which means that the molecules are just moving further apart. All right, so that's the reason why the interpretation is important, the final interpretation. All right, so this brings us to the next point. This is the isoth isothermal expansion. Okay, isothermal means constant temperature. All right, so whatever it is that we're doing, we're not changing the temperature. So that's what it means. Isothermal means it's constant temperature expansion. So uh, we notice that everything is insulated to an extent that there's absolutely, I said it wrong. So it's done in such a way that expansion is taking place in such a way that the temperature of the gas remains constant. So you expand it while feeding heat in. So you're heating it up and then you're expanding it at the same time and you do it just so that there's no change in temperature. So it's heated accordingly. As you're expanding it, you put more heat into it. And as you can see, there's one, and then you got uh, three uh, arrows just wiggling around, just feeding heat into the system. So you just put in just enough heat that the temperature remains constant. So this is isothermal expansion. When there's an expansion taking place at constant temperature, so notice that the expansion is taking place, the temperature is gonna remain constant. So if you're expanding the system at constant temperature, what happens, the pressure, goes down. So the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. So if the temperature is constant, if you increase the volume, the pressure inside is going to go down. Okay, so so this is known as the isothermal expansion or compression. Either way, I'll use both titles. So T is constant. All right, so what's happening is, as you expand the system at constant temperature, the pressure is going to go down. So T is constant. It's known as isothermal. So the volume is changing. The volume increases, the pressure goes down. That's what it means. All right, so this is the amount of work done during an isothermal expansion or compression. And this formula represents the amount of work done. Okay. Okay, so the question is, where do we get this formula from? Okay, so we'll address that question before we address that question. Let's just express this concept in terms of the change in the internal energy of the system. So the internal energy of the system is going to go down by the amount of work done during the isothermal expansion or compression. If it's a compression, obviously, internal energy is going to go up. If it's an expansion, internal energy is going to go down. All right, so the question is, where do we get that formula from? OK, so this requires a derivation. OK, there's no way you can explain that natural log without using a derivation. OK, so this is the amount of work which is going to get done during an expansion process. All right, so we are assuming that the Ideal gas is going to undergo the expansion process. That's the reason why we're using PV and NRT equals NRT. Okay, so number of moles are the ideal gas constant. These are constant. Temperature is constant as well. So, which means that the pressure is going to be inversely proportional to the volume. All right, so the pressure is going to be constant here, but it's going to be inversely proportional to the volume. So, which means that this expression can be substituted for P. All right, I just explained that for constant temperature, 
the pressure is universally related to the volume for whatever reason, I decided that I should do that. All right, so I'll do a back substitution. And all of a sudden, okay, so we end up getting an expression in the uh, integral. All right, so the volume is gonna change. So by the amount of work that you do, this is how much the volume is gonna change relative to the initial volume expression that we have. And when you do the integral, dv divided by v of this integral is gonna be ln v, integrate between these two limits. All right, and so obviously the evaluate the natural log of the volume between these two limits. So you end up getting this expression. There's a negative sign here, and this is a natural log. Natural log of one expression minus the second expression can be expressed in terms of natural log of first expression divided by the second expression. As a result, we came up with an expression for the work during thermal expansion. That's it. So internal energy of the system can be expressed like this, all right? This is a formula that we started to lecture out with. Okay, so this is the internal energy of an ideal gas. Okay, so what's happening is if it's a thermal expansion at constant temperature, the internal energy of the system is not gonna change. So there's no change in temperature. If there's no change in temperature, there's no change in internal energy. All right, so if there's no change in internal energy, the amount of work that you do is gonna come from the amount of heat that goes in and comes out of the system. All right, so during a thermal process, the amount of heat that you put into the system is gonna be responsible for the work. Or the amount of work that you do is gonna be responsible for the heat that you generate. That's the meaning of it. All right, it sounds, the stuff that I'm talking about, I know it's going real fast, which is normal at this point, but it's things, these concepts take a while to sit in. All right, so you have to kind of think about it. So what I'm doing is I'm changing the volume at constant temperature. Okay, and I can change the volume at constant temperature by heating up the system, all right? So the amount of work done by this expansion is the same as the amount of heat that you, I put into the system. So none of this heat goes into or comes out the internal energy of the molecules. So the molecules are not energized. Everything that I put in in the form of heat goes into causing the expansion process. It goes into the amount of work that you can generate. So when the piston expands, all the heat that you put in goes into expanding the piston and none of the molecules become energized. So the amount of heat that you put in and the amount of work that you get out of the system will be the same. That's what it means. Okay, so and there's something called the isochoric process on top of it. Isochoric means the constant volume. Okay, so whatever this is, <laughs> the volume is gonna remain constant. So you kind of know what's gonna happen, guys. So if you got a constant volume, so you heat it up, what's gonna happen? It's like the constant volume of thinking in terms of the uh, car tires, right? The volume is constant. So if you heat it up, what do you think is gonna happen? The volume is not gonna change. So none of the heat that you put in is gonna go into, none of the heat that you put in is gonna go into work, okay? Because the volume does not expand. So if it's not expanding, you cannot do any work. So the amount of heat that you put in is only gonna go into the internal energy of the system, which means that the temperature is gonna go up. So it's an ideal gas once again. So you, if you cannot change the volume, then the heat that you put in is just gonna increase the temperature. So the pressure is gonna go up. All right, so this section is the volume remains constant. Everything else is a constant. All right, so the temperature goes up, the pressure is gonna go up. We've seen this before. All right, so if you're keeping the volume constant, the only thing that happens is the pressure goes up, the constant volume. All right, so no work is being done because the volume is not gonna change. So the amount of heat that you put in is gonna go into changing the temperature. All right, so, and here's the formula for the internal energy. Okay, here's the generalized formula for the internal energy. So the amount of heat that you put in is gonna go into the internal energy of the system. Okay, so here's the first law. Okay, so system, the tires will not expand, obviously. It's not gonna change. So no work is being done when you actually heat up the tires, when you put the heat into the tires, okay? All the heat that you put in is gonna go into the internal energy. The tires are not able to expand, so no work is being done. And so the internal energy of the system is expressed by this formula. The heat that you put in is gonna be expressed that formula, by that formula. And okay, so, I wanted to come up with an expression here, but let me check to see what I want to do here. So a change in temperature is going to be the same in both cases. N will be the same in both cases. 
And then all of a sudden, this is going to give us an expression that we will kind of relish on a little bit. Okay. This C sub V represents this specific heat capacity at constant volume. And this is going to be three house R. <laughs> this is the sort of stuff that you guys will hate. Most of you guys will hate, but we have to talk about it because there's something interesting here. And hopefully you will appreciate it when we get to it. Let me just mention it just briefly. Get back to the definition of specific heat capacity. It represents the resistance to change in temperature. It's like the heat inertia. That's my description of it. And somehow there's going to be a certain amount of resistance to change in temperature. It's going to depend on the volume. And there's also going to be a certain amount of change in resistance to temperature, I don't know, at constant pressure. All right, so this represents the change in, this represents the resistance to change in temperature at constant volume. All right, it happens to be three halves of this constant, which is the ideal gas constant. Okay, so whatever that means, right now, everything is extremely abstract. We're still in the domain of mathematics, and we end up pulling out a term which could be expressed in terms of R. Okay, so what does that mean conceptually? It means exactly what I said it, it is, but aside from that, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything else for now, but it's gonna mean something slightly more. Only thing that we will do just for now, if you're dealing with the internal energy of any sort of gas, in this case, the ideal gas, yes, instead of representing the internal energy in terms of three halves N R T delta T, N R delta T, we will take this three halves R and then we will substitute C sub V for it. So this C sub V that you're looking at, specifically capacity of constant volume represents three halves. So well, this formula undergoes a tr transformation. So this formula becomes that formula. All right, so these are just standard formulas. So that's the formula that we will get to use for that purpose. All right, so moving forward, Specific air capacity at constant pressure is going to be larger than the specific air capacity at constant volume. All right, so the amount of resistance to temperature change is going to depend on whether it's a constant pressure or constant volume environment. So the question becomes, why is it that when the pressure is constant, the, the gas need, happens to be more resistant to temperature change? Okay, guys, remember, the, the resistance to temperature change is almost like heat inertia. Like the substance wants to remain at the same temperature, which means that the molecules want to retain more or less the same kinetic energy. You can kind of figure that out. It may be related to literally the masses of the molecules or how rigidly these molecules are connected to each other because temperature is also related to the vibrations and the rotations. Okay, so all this, this almost gives you an insight into the atomic theory or the molecular theory by looking at when the pressure is constant, they, they, it seems like A, they, they have a better better chance of retaining their initial motions longer than when the volume is constant. All right, so you can almost look at this, something like this and visualize what's going on. If not now, maybe later or never, I don't know. It depends, depends on what you wanna do with your life. All right, so this is the amount of heat that you're putting into the system. We got a formula for it already at constant pressure. All right, so this is especially the capacity for that. So we'll just substitute that in. And this is the amount of work that we do. It's at constant pressure. So there's an expansion of the volume. So the gas is expanding by doing work. It could be moving a piston or something. And in doing so, um, so what's happening is it's constant pressure, the temperature is changing. Because you're putting heat into the system, that's gonna increase the temperature. As the temperature is changing, the system is doing work in essence by undergoing an expansion. So, so what happens to the internal energy of the system? So we have an expression for the internal energy, which is expressed in terms of specific heat capacity at constant volume. So they substitute these back into this formula. So everything got subsidized. And so now we're looking for a relationship. We're trying to figure out why this value, C sub P is larger than C sub V. And then that's what we're trying to figure out. We got the same temperature change on both sides. So we can factor out delta T from both sides. Also, we got the same ends on both sides. So factor out ends on the right-hand side. And then cancel out the like terms. And all of a sudden, we come up with an expression that looks like this. So evidently these uh, specific capacities for constant volume and pressure could be expressed in terms of R. All right, so let's isolate C sub P. And when we, we're not isolating C sub P evidently. Okay, so I'm getting R all by itself. Evidently this ideal gas constant, whatever this is, is the difference between these two pressures. Uh, these difference between these two values, the specific capacity of constant pressure and constant volume. All right, so all of a sudden we come up with this expression. Okay, so which means that the 
specific capacity constant pressure is going to be larger than specific capacity constant volume by R. And all of a sudden, we got this weird connection. So which means that this R is a constant will mean something. In this case, it's just the difference between these two values. All right, so, but we know that C sub V can be expressed in terms of R. So which means that we can express C sub P in terms of R. And then when we express it in terms of R, it's going to be 5R divided by 2. All right, now we got an expression for both uh, specific capacities in terms of the ideal, ideal gas constant. All right, and then um, just goofing around. All right, so for the stuff that we just came up with, it's just for ideal gases. And then all of a sudden, physicists go, okay, so when you have these ideal gases, and it's an idealized gas, which means that you got these molecules, non interacting molecules, uh, you ignore the gravitational force, the electrostatic force, or whatever, and these molecules are just moving around with, and without even colliding with each other. If they do, obviously, they, it's going to be an elastic, elastic collision or whatever. But the question is, how realistic is this model? Can we generalize it into real gases? And all of a sudden, they go, wait a minute, yeah, we should be able to. Now, if it's a single molecule, it can move three-dimensionally, right? All right, so we say, okay, if it's a single molecule, it can move along the X, Y, Z directions. So we say it's got three degrees of freedom. Okay, degrees of freedom tells you how many different ways it can move. All right, so this has got three degrees of freedom if it's a single atom on an atomic. If it's, if you got two atoms connected, now we got a molecule, diatomic, for example. Okay, it can move along the X, Y, Z dimensions, but you know, it can also spin this way. So that's the fourth axis. This is the axis of rotation, or it can spin this way. This would be the fifth axis. Uh, this would be the fifth different way it can move. So it's got five degrees of freedom. So this is diatomic, or you can have multiple uh, atoms attached in weird ways. So, which means that they can, this can move three dimensionally. It can spin along this axis or the other axis, and it can also vibrate. All right, so it's got six axes, it's got six degrees of freedom. So what we do with this is you take this first formula and notice that in the first formula is three halves and we end up getting this three when we're, we're looking at the first derivation. Um, we're gonna remember the molecules inside this container that we end up using, coming up with the formula for the uh, internal energy, the original formula. And we end up getting three because the molecules were free to move three dimensionally. Okay, so this three represents the degrees of freedom. So if it's diatomic, now this turns into five. If it's polyatomic, then it turns it into six, if you're looking at. All right, so these, you can generalize these formulas just like that. And then as a result, you end up getting um, formulas which are fairly realistic. All right, so mono monoatomic, you got the helium. All right, so it's translational, which means the center mass is going to move on the X, Y, Z dimensions. If that's the case, for this, we end up using three halves. For that, we end up using five halves. Oxygen is diatomic, okay, so it's got translational, it's got rotational. So it's got total of that. Polyatomic, obviously translational, like that, but there's three rotational axes, so it's gonna be six that you end up using. Okay, let's just move on to the next one. And that's it. Uh, I was hoping that there would be more, but that's it, okay. Now the adiabatic expansion. So adiabatic is something that you've probably never heard of before. Okay, adiabatic means that its expansion takes place at a constant heat. What that means is there's not gonna be any heat transferred in or out of a system. So there's no heat flow into the system and there's no heat flow out of the system. So the heat is not gonna go into the system. It's a per perfectly insulated system. That's what it is. So no heat going in or coming out of the system. All right, so it's a perfectly insulated system. It's an adiabatic expansion. So what that means is the internal energy of the system is gonna change by the amount of work that you do or done by the system. Okay, so somehow if, you, if this is an air mass, if you compress it really hard, really fast, if you compress it really fast without allowing any sort of heat transfer, internal energy of the system is gonna go up, which means that the temperature is gonna go up. And how do I know the temperature is gonna go up? You'll find out. And if you're allowed to allow, if you allow this to expand real suddenly without giving heat a chance to uh, influence the system, as a result, the internal energy of the system is going to go down. It depends on how fast you can do this, usually, because if you do it fast enough so that there's no heat transfer, it's called an adiabatic expansion or compression. 
So you let it expand real fast. Okay, I'm talking about air in this case. If you let it expand really, really fast, what's happening is the internal energy of the system is going to go down, which means the temperature of the system is going to drop. Okay. So if you let it expand, the temperature of the system is going to go down. It's going to cool down really, really fast by the amount of expansion that it undergoes. Okay. Um, why is it that I have so much stuff here? I wonder if I forgot to break it down. It's started to feel like a real physics lecture. All right. Okay. So adiabatic process. Oh, oh damn. Okay. Now I remember it. Okay, all right, guys, we'll get back to it shortly. I think I know how this happened. Okay, so when I was preparing this lecture uh, originally, you spent a few hours just doing the derivations and everything else, and then you edit this and break it into smaller and smaller pieces. And so evidently, I didn't have time to break it into smaller and smaller pieces, and then you got a, a two-hour lecture compressed to a six-minute presentation obviously when i'm explaining it this 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 just started to feel like this real lectures that you will listen to at the universities it's tough to follow when somebody's lecturing like that it's not meant to be like that so which means that i must have used i'm using the same clip so this is this lecture is still a work in progress evidently the only thing that i want to talk about is the thermal expansion and the thermal isothermal expansion is the Temperature is constant. That's it. Okay. So, all right. So, constant temperature. So, uh, during the expansion process, the pressure is going to go down. Okay. So, that's it. If the, if the temperature remains constant, if you expand it, okay, during the expansion process, the pressure goes down. All right. So, that's where we were like 20 minutes ago. And the amount of work done through the expansion is going to be expressed by this formula. I wanted to show you the derivation, which I did. Okay, so that's so. And then instead of just talking about it nonstop as if this is a graduate level course, okay, so this is, I wanted to jump into a simple example so we could, we could play with the concept a little bit, okay, to get a better understanding. All right, so this time I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, so this is a slightly different version of what we were discussing before. Okay, this time we've got argon is expressed in terms of the number of moles that the gas has, temperature is given. And this gas is expanding isothermally, which means that the temperature is going to remain constant. All right, so it's going to undergo a volume change. And so we make the assumption that argon is going to behave like an ideal gas. Okay, so what is the work done by the gas while it's expanding? Okay, so and then we'll take a look at the change in its internal energy. And then we'll also take a look at the heat supply to the gas. Okay, so that's those other things that we will take a look at. All right, so we've got two moles of argon gas. Temperature remains constant. Initial volume, the final volume. And the, 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 all right, so I'm expressing this in terms of temperature. So 78 degree Fahrenheit. So what's the amount of work? How much internal energy is going to change? All right, so this gas is going to expand. So expansion, it's going to push out other gases or whatever. So work has to be done. By the amount of work done, the internal energy is going to go down. And then what else? And we will heat up the gas at constant temperature. So this is the amount of heat that's going to go into the gas. So work done by the gas while it's expanding at constant temperature is this. So this is the formula. So plug the numbers and we get a number. OK, so these numbers, I'm generating numbers. These numbers in a, in, in of themselves, they don't mean anything. It just means if it's multiple choices, you'll find the right number right now. Okay, and then we'll take a look at the internal energy, change in the internal energy of the system. So that's going to depend on the temperature, change in temperature. And there's no change in temperature in this case. So obviously, so internal energy is going to remain constant. So what that means is the amount of work that you do is going to go in or will come out of the heat that you put into the system. So all the heat that we put into the system is going to go into expanding the gas. Okay, now the number is going to make sense. Okay, these numbers make sense when you do comparison. So this is the amount of heat that you're putting into the system, and this is the amount of work done by the system. Okay, and they should match if the the temperature is constant. Okay, now the concept makes sense. Okay, so all right, so that was the isothermal expansion and compression. All right, so this is something that we already discussed. Okay, isochoric heating. Okay, so that means that the pressure is going to be constant. 
Oh, evidently I broke it down already. All right, I did my editing already. So the other slide that I was using forever needs to be deleted. Okay, so there's no change in volume. So which means that no work is being done. It's like the car tires, if you're not allowed to expand it. So which means that the amount of heat that you put in is gonna go into the internal energy of the system. In this case, um, it's just gonna go into the temperature. So the temperature of the system is gonna rise up. So the heat is gonna change, increase the temperature of the gas inside. So that goes into the internal energy of the system. All right, so let me just take a look. I said thermal expansion. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay. And then we had a discussion about that. Oh, okay, so I'm glad that this stuff is here. Um, I was looking for it. All right, so especially capacity, constant pressure versus the volume. All right, so constant pressure is gonna be larger than constant volume. So just do a comparison of these numbers. Okay, so constant, especially capacity, constant pressure is gonna be larger than constant volume. We already discussed that, but this is how we know that, you know, it's just, these are experimental numbers and this is what they were able to generate. So this is larger than that. So what is the mathematical reasoning for that that we were looking at? All right, so I just wanna make sure I keep putting this in, move forward. System expansion. Okay, so we already had. Okay, so this was the discussion that we were having, and well, we didn't. You can't really come up with a um, conceptual understanding of it. It's just you, drive, you go through the mathematics, and the only thing that you realize is this is going to be larger than that by this much, and somehow the degrees of freedom is going to matter. Okay, and then you can make the association that hey, this represents the. Uh, Resistance to change in temperature at constant pressure versus volume, and it may be related to the size of the molecules and the rigidness of the connections of the molecules or whatever. So kind of it until you start taking more advanced courses and then you have a better idea of that sort of stuff. Okay, so the isobaric expansion is the expansion in constant pressure. All right, so let's focus on this problem. Okay, so um, we've got a bubble of helium. Okay, so it is submerged at a certain depth in liquid water. So it, it's, it's, so we got a bubble of helium in water in essence. So the water as well as the helium will undergo a temperature change. So the temperature is gonna increase and this is gonna happen at constant pressure. So we've got a bubble of helium in water, you increase the temperature at constant pressure. And then the bubble is gonna get bigger, it's gonna expand. So how much heat is added to the helium during the expansion if the temperature increases. So not only the helium is expanding, its temperature is also changing. Okay. So, and then the question is, what's the change in internal energy of helium and how much work is done by the helium as it expands against the surrounding water? Okay, so we got the five moles of helium bubble. All right, so the increase in temperature is gonna be 20 degrees right there. Pressure is going to be constant. In water, the pressure is only going to depend on depth. So how much heat is um, added to helium during the expansion process as the temperature is increasing? What's the change in internal energy of helium when you increase the temperature? And what is the amount of work done by helium when it's expanding against water? Okay, it's an interesting enough question, but Still a simple example. All right, so the amount of heat that goes into helium depends on how much you want to change the temperature. So we want to increase the temperature by 20 degrees of Celsius or 20 Kelvin. Okay, so this is the amount of heat that you put in. The amount of heat that you put in is going to depend on the number of moles, and it's going to depend on the resistance to change in temperature at this constant pressure. So that's going to depend on the specific capacity. All right, so there, there are two things that you could do. You could take a look at the specific capacity of helium in on a table somewhere, or you can calculate. All right, so specific capacity is gonna be two R divided by five. All right, at constant pressure is gonna be five divided by two R. That's it, I think I said it wrong initially. I wasn't paying attention. All right, so boom. So this is gonna be five fifths R. If, as long as you know what R is, it's gonna be, what is it? Um, eight point something. 
as long as what R is, you just plug the numbers in. It's going to be 8, 9, 13, I think. All right, and that's pretty much it. So you can solve this problem easily without looking it up using that formula. All right, so changing the internal energy, as long as you know C sub B is going to be uh, three halves R. And if you know what R is, obviously, once again, you know N, you know the change in temperature in terms of Kelvin, you're able to generate this number. And the amount of work that you do um, depends on how much the volume is going to change at a given pressure. So this is the amount of work done by the expanding gas against water. All right, so constant volume change in the constant pressure change in volume. We don't know it's the change in volume given to us. All right, um, does it, okay, I don't know. Change in volume is not given to us, but obviously change in temperature is given to us. So, which means that we can express the change in volume in terms of change in temperature. So this expression becomes that expression, and then we do a back substitution, and that's it. Okay, so that problem wasn't the most interesting, but obviously it works out. So we had a discussion about this already. All right, um, okay, so this is another thing that I was looking for, and I'm glad I was able to find it. All right, so for an ideal gas, Okay, guys, for an ideal gas, if it's a single atom monoatomic system, notice that this is the predicted value for an ideal gas, and here's what how the real gases behave. So notice that the, these values are very close to an ideal gas value. Diatomic, for an ideal gas, this is an approximation. The real gases behave like an ideal gas, so that's also awesome. Polyatomic, okay, the, the, all of a sudden you got a big deviation, all right? I don't want to say a big deviation, but there's a significant deviation here. So the monoatomic and diatomic molecules behave very much like ideal gases and polyatomic molecules are a little bit, there's a bit of a deviation from what's expected. So the question is why? All right. So we got the uh, adiabatic expansion. So that's the last thing that we were discussing. So we'll get back to the discussion regarding this one. All right, so there's no heat transfer in or out of the system. All right, so this is known as the adiabatic expansion. So what's happening is if there's no heat transfer, the temperature is gonna drop during the expansion process. If you reverse the process, if you compress this, because you're not adding heat into the system, all of a sudden the temperature is gonna increase. All right, so if you could suddenly expand something, a gas, is, if the gas is allowed to expand like that, immediately it's gonna cool down. If you can just compress it really fast, it's immediately it's gonna heat up. All right, pressure goes up, the temperature is gonna go up. Expand it, the temperature is gonna drop real fast. When I say sudden expansion or compression, you do the expansion and compression real fast, not allowing any sort of heat to leak into the system or leak out of the system. That's what it means. All right, so we've seen this one before. Five minutes into the flight. All right, so this guy ends up getting... They have damaged some parts of the airplane system, and so we're going to have to check those out. When a leak develops in the system and the oxygen is pouring out, it's expanding so fast that it gets very, very cold. Flesh is susceptible to frostbite, and those coldest parts are something... This guy got a frostbite because of the oxygen leaking out of the oxygen tube and expanding. So sudden expansion of oxygen end up cooling the skin down to an extent that it's going to end up getting a frostbite. So my concern over, over uh, being burned by the cold temperatures is what caused me to point to your point on deck right away and, and get out of the cockpit. Rob moved through the first set of... All right, so sudden expansion of oxygen or any sort of gas, why would it cause it cooling down? So what's the phenomena behind it? It's called adiabatic expansion or compression. This happens so fast that there's no heat transfer in and out of the system. All right, so uh, the example that you're looking at, in this case, it's a completely insulated stand. That this, this region is completely insulated from any sort of heat entering into the system or leaving the system. Uh, this is, well, I kind of say it's realistic up to a certain extent, but the adiabatic compression or expansion usually is something that we deal with if there's a sudden expansion or compression. So which means that the heat doesn't get a chance to actually flow in and out of the system. It does, but not a significant extent. So what's happening is notice that when there's a sudden expansion just like that, there's going to be a temperature drop. And if there's a sudden compression, there's going to be a temperature gain. All right, so the sudden expansion is going to drop the temperature, and then sudden compression is going to increase the temperature of that system. All right, so that's, that's what it is from a perspective of looking at graphs, but what's causing it to happen. So what's the physics behind it? Okay, so we, we'll come up with a mathematical model, but who's still responsible for the physics of it. All right, so case in point, let's do a small demonstration of it. Okay, so when you actually push the air out of your lips, and then when your lips, when your mouth, just keep it large enough so you can actually feel how warm your air is on your palm. And when you purse lips together, purse your lips together and do the same thing. 
you will notice that the air is not as hot. It's actually much cooler. It's the same exact phenomenon. So you're pushing the air through a smaller opening, all of a sudden it cools down, and you're pushing the air through a larger opening, it's fairly hot. So the question is, what caused that to cool down? The wrong answer is, oh, I'm looking at the graph, it's an adiabatic process, so the heat doesn't get a chance to transfer, and hence the reason blah, 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 this, this course is not, of course, in poetry. This is part of the reason why you guys, some of you guys struggle in this course. In terms of explaining stuff, I'm looking for an explanation involving molecules. Okay, so you go back to the definition of thermodynamics. Definition is, it's a study of heat, so we're dealing with heat, and its relationship to the mechanical energy of the molecules, or internal energy of the molecules. So, uh, which means that, what is heat? It's a form of energy that flows from hot to cold. And how does it affect the motion of the molecules and the structure of the molecules, in essence? And also, this, you got this adiabatic process, which is weird. It's weird because there's absolutely no transfer of heat within the system. Yet things are either heating up if you compress it really hard, or they are cooling down if you just if you just expand it real fast. Okay. And then the question is, well, explain that using the, the atomic theory. Okay. And good luck with that. Okay, so that's where the understanding is. Everything else is poetry. It's either mathematical poetry or it's verbal poetry. If you cannot explain it using the concepts of atoms and molecules, you somehow fail in physics. You just go through the motions without learning anything. So the task on it on hand is, yeah, let's just do the mathematical poetry a little bit, but still the question remains, what's going on? What's going on here? So summary statement, sudden expansion, adiabatic expansion, which means that there's no transfer of heat in and out of the system. And in real life cases, this can happen in highly insulated systems or sudden compressions or expansions. All right, so either way, it's gonna work. Now let's do a little bit of mathematical poetry. All right, this is called mathematical model. So normally we like to think that this is real physics. Real physics happens only when you start to think about the meaning of what we are doing at this point in terms of how the molecules are behaving and how the molecules are being affected, how the structure of the molecules are changing because of heat, all right? So you have to always keep going back and checking to see what's going on and be able to explain it kind of visually in your head. Nice thing about classical physics, I don't care what kind of classical physics you're doing, everything is visualizable. Modern physics, not so much. All right, so adiabatic expansion, no transfer of heat. All right, so uh, the amount of work which is gonna be done doing an ex adiabatic expansion, either on the system or by the system is gonna be represented by this formula. All right, so the question becomes why this formula? We'll find out. So there's no heat transfer in and out of the system. So the internal energy, how much the internal energy is gonna change is gonna depend on the amount of, amount of work done by the system on the system. And as a result for the amount of energy, change in energy, internal energy of the system can be represented using the same formula that we just saw. All right, uh, and then we will have two expressions that we will be looking at. There's a relationship between pressure and the volume, which is gonna remain constant during the expansion and compression process. And then the volume is going to be raised to the power of gamma that you're looking at. And the gamma is going to signify this ratio. Uh, so this is a specific heat capacity at constant pressure. And this is a specific heat capacity at constant volume. Okay. This is almost like teaching engineering at this point. Because it's almost like formulas are appearing out of nowhere. You don't know from where. You may start, sus you may start suspecting that we're getting them from space aliens. Or you may also convince yourself that your instructor is a space alien. Hence the debate about Tesla being possibly a space alien. All right, um, so which means that because we don't like those kind of uh, allegations, I'm just gonna take you through the derivations of these formulas. So the other thing we know is you're looking at the difference between the specific capacity, constant pressure and volume, that's gonna give you R, that's the, that's the uh, ideal gas constant. And then all of a sudden you end up getting a second relationship, the formula that you get to use whenever you're solving simple physics problems using for the multiple choice portion of the test. Now you got the uh, relationship between temperature and the volume. All right, once again, this relationship is gonna remain constant. So when the temperature goes up, let's put it this way, when the volume goes up, the temperature is gonna go down. When the volume goes down, the temperature is gonna go up. Okay, uh, following the relationship which is set up by this formula that you're looking at. So what I just showed you is a summary statement of what we are gonna do. Okay, so that this is the adiabatic expansion or compression. And these are the formulas involved in this section. So which means that we need to justify each and every single formula. This one is straightforward. So this is the work done by or on the expanding or compressing gas. So how do we know that this formula is correct? This is the relationship between pressure and volume. So if the volume goes up, the pressure is gonna go down quite a bit. If the volume goes down, the pressure is gonna go up quite a bit. That's what it means. 
And you get this expression sigma, sigma is going to be expressed like that. And then relationship between temperature and volume. All right, so the volume goes up, the temperature goes down, the volume goes down, the temperature goes up, and that's... You know. Every bottle of champagne has a warning label that says, use caution when opening. Point away from... <laughs> face. All right, so when there's a sudden expansion like that, every bottle of champ champagne is actually going to cool down. Champagne has a warning label that says it cools. Use cool caution. Down. It's, if you look at the picture of that region, also that region is going to be cool away from because there's going to be a sudden expansion. Like that. As this is going to so that portion is going to be uh, this portion is experiencing sudden expansion. So it's fairly this region is getting cooler. Than that. Okay. Or else, I, you know, just talking about it like this, you get it, I get it, but, you know, it's way too abstract. First time around, you know, I'm listening to a lecture like that. I'm like, what am I doing in physics? That was the first question I had for myself because I, I was like, who cares? Heat flows this way or that way. Eventually, you're oh, it's a big deal. So you get a better appreciation as you start to get older for some reason. All right. So there's no heat transfer, right? So the internal energy is going to change by the amount of work we've done. Work could be done by the expanding gas. Or you can compress the gas. So when you compress the gas, obviously that's the work done on the gas. It's gonna go into the internal energy of the system. Everything that I said so far is common sense. Again. All right, so here's the change in internal energy of the system. Okay, so we expressed this using two formulas. We had a huge derivation on this and then I just went blah, blah, blah for like 20 minutes. Okay, I don't know how much of it you got. If you didn't catch any of it, it's not a big deal. So it's not a derivation based course, but know that this is the internal energy of an ideal gas, which can also be expressed in terms of this formula. These two formulas are identical. All right, delta T is the same, N is the same, so which means that three, this three halves R is going to be the same as, as C sub V. All right, instead of putting on three halves R, it's easier to put on C sub C sub V in essence. It's like either you can call Michael Michael or Mike. People usually shorten the stuff. You do the same thing in physics. All right, so um, you do a back substitution. This is the change in internal energy of the system. The work, it's in this case, the, um, this is a generic expression for work, the pressure causing an expansion of the gas. All right, so once again, we're looking at an ideal gas. All right, so here's an adiabatic expansion. We expect to see a temperature to drop. Okay, now this is mathematically, when I say mathematical poetry, this is not, it's the, doing a derivation like this is not evidently the easiest thing either, okay? Because we are gonna try to come up with a bunch of expressions. So change in volume. So the volume is changing. So notice that the change in volume is here. Uh, will the pressure remain constant? when the change, volume is changing. So the answer to that question is absolutely not. Look, as the volume is changing, this expression is not constant. All right, so I'm starting off with a generic expression for work, which is pressure causing change in volume, but the pressure is also gonna change, right? Aside from the volume. So I'm noticing that A, so I'm also I'm noticing that this is not, algebra is not gonna work in those things. As much as I love, I favor algebra in explaining physics because I want you to get a really good sense of what's going on from a molecular perspective. All of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, the algebra is not gonna get work because we got three variables here. All right, so the pressure is changing, volume is changing, temperature is changing, and all of a sudden, yeah, so the algebraic physics is not gonna work, so which means that we have to resort to some violence here. So, uh, which means that calculus needs to be introduced at this point. Okay, so I'll take the ideal gas law, and then I'll check to see what happens. So on the left-hand side, I can keep the pressure constant and change the volume, right? So that's one way of changing the variable on the left-hand side. Or I can keep the volume constant and change the pressure on the left-hand side. And either way, in either case, the temperature is going to change on the right hand side. Okay, so now I'm trying to figure out a way to develop the mathematics. When I say I'm trying to figure it out, this is more like a derivation from a book somewhere. I didn't sit down and invented it. I picked a book that I like. Usually it's held in and resting originally. And then I usually give a lecture like that once or twice. I get, oh, if I don't like the derivation, it's not very intuitive. I, now I try to get a different book, check to see if it's more intuitive. If not, check to see if I can drive it myself uh, using my basic understanding of what's going on. All right, so this is an attempt from Halliday and Resting, which is the book that I really favor, or I used to favor. So, um, all right, so what are we gonna do? So the, we set this up with three variables like that. Okay, so this is a differential equation of some sort. Volume is changing, the pressure is changing, change in volume changes the temperature. Okay, so. Temperature is going to change if the volume is changing. The temperature is going to change if the pressure is changing, obviously. Um, so I'm isolating n times dt on the, in the, using this equation. Uh, okay, so 
Let's back up just a little bit. I said it wrong. Okay. So evidently, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to combine. Okay, I'm checking to see. I, okay, so what I wanted to say originally, and then last my my train of thought, is you got three variables. You don't want to have three variables when we were solving a problem like that. It would be better to have two variables. Easier to solve the problem. All right. So you two variables could be pressure and temperature, or could be volume and temperature. So you have to make a decision. So it's easier to reduce to this into two variables. Okay, now we're in the domain of mathematics. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing that this volume expression could be expressed in terms of the temperature. All right, so volume expression could be, volume differential here could be expressed in terms of the temperature differential. So, which means that now we can worry about how uh, fast the, the pressure changes with temperature. Okay, so as a result, I'm just going to take this expression and then I'm just going to massage it. Evidently, I want to express the temperature in terms of the volume. Right? So that's the direction that I'm going to go. So the temperature is going to get expressed in terms of volume by using this expression. I could have done the opposite as well. It's still where I've worked out, okay, except um, it would have worked out. I would have gotten the same way. Anyway, let's move forward with the book derivation at this point. All right, so you got the, okay, so we end up getting a differential with, with two variables in this case. So there's a volume variable, there's a pressure variable, that's it. So we don't have to worry about the temperature variable under the circumstances. Okay, so. R is something that we can express using the specific capacities for pressure and volume. All right, so let's do a back substitution. And then we can simplify this further. Notice that um, this divided by that minus CV, C sub V divided by C sub V. All right, this is going to be one. And we'll take this expression as gamma, I think. All right, so that's where the gamma comes from. So we'll do a back substitution again. All right, and continue with the derivation. All right, so we got P times the differential of volume. Differential volume here, differential volume here, the pressure is here, pressure is here. Okay, so we can combine the like terms on the same side and move down like terms across. All right, so we can factor out the pressure and the differential volume. All right, and we can simplify this. One minus one is gonna be zero, so which means that this expression multiplied by gamma as we've got on the left-hand side. All right, and then all of a sudden, th th there's a simple differential equation here that we can solve. When I say simple differential equation, guys, uh, what I'm doing is I say differential equations, it's calculus in essence. All right, so notice that I'm keeping the pressure terms on the right, the volume terms on the left, that's what I'm doing. So I'm pulling the like terms to the left as well as the right. All right, now I'm, there's gonna be a volume expansion or compression. So volume is gonna go from initial to final volume is the pressure is going to go from an initial to a final pressure. All right, so uh, this expression, differential volume divided by the volume itself is going to be the natural log of the volume on the left-hand side. All right, evaluate at the limits. Okay, this expression is the natural log of the pressure evaluated at its limits as well. All right, so these are the limits that you're looking at. All right, so natural log of a value, the one value minus the natural log of a different value is the same as the natural log of the first value divided by the second value. And it's the same on the right-hand side. All right, and okay, so what else do I want to do? Okay, so when you have an expression like this, notice that gamma is up front. All right, so you can pull this expression above. That's called algebra. I'm not making this up. So uh, <laughs> at this point, it's not calculus, it's algebra. And then this negative sign, which is negative one, can be pulled up as a power of the natural log, just like that as well. Okay, mo most books usually wouldn't show you these little steps, but that's fine. All right, so this is a natural log of an expression raised to the power of negative one, so which means that you can invert this expression and get rid of that negative. All right, so left-hand side is gonna remain the same. The right-hand side is gonna look like this. Okay, this is beautiful work. And then if you wanna get rid of natural logs, okay, raise both sides to the power of uh, exponential that you're looking at. All right, so these are inverse functions, so they will cancel, so as a result, the volume terms and the pressure terms will remain. And you can just organize these terms uh, in a sense that you can multiply both sides P and then you can multiply both sides by VO expressions. And then this is it. So we came up with this expression. So what that means is the, the combination of pressure and the volume expressions will be constant. So if you increase the volume, the pressure is going to go down and the pressure is going to go down significantly because everything is raised to the power of gamma that you're looking at. So that's one expression that we talked about before. 
All right, now let's take a look at the relationship between volume and temperature. So once again, we use the ideal gas law. All right, so sum for P. Now we'll do a back substitution. All right, so we did a back substitution here on both sides. Okay, and NRs are common on both sides, so NRs will cancel. All right, so here's the volume raised to the power of gamma. Okay, so this V can be expressed in terms of V to, to raised to the power of negative one, so which means that the, the, the powers are subtractive at this point or additive. So this expression is simplified to this expression. That's what I'm getting at. All right, so which means that we were able to come up with a second expression. So which means that when the volume goes up, temperature is going to go down. But when the volume goes up, it's going up by this value, the power of this value that you're looking at. So which means that the temperature is going to drop quite a bit. When there's a sudden expansion, the temperature drops quite a bit. That's 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 what it. Does. All right, so that's what we uh, get a few problems so you guys know how this is done. And then we'll have a discussion about what's going on. The actual physics of it is simple. The mathematical derivation was kind of lengthy. All right, so in one of the combustion chambers, how about diesel engine? So it's a combustion chamber. So if it's a combustion chamber, processes are taking place so fast that the heat doesn't get a chance to transfer in or out of the system usually. It does, but it's, it's just, it happens so fast that it's, it's minuscule or it's ignorable. So the piston compresses the air-fuel mixture from an initial volume to final volume, obviously, and the initial temperature of the mixture is given. So this is going to be an adiabatic compression. Okay, so if you're dealing with an adiabatic compression, it's this gamma factor that you're looking at is always going to be 1.4 for an ideal gas. The numbers always work out like that. All right, so, so what's the final temperature? So, okay, so before we even solve the problem conceptually, I have an idea. I'm looking at the amount of volume which is going to change. So the volume is going to change quite a bit. And this is going to be a fairly fast compression. So the, which means that the gas is going to heat up quite a bit. So this is 40 degrees Celsius. I don't know, it's like maybe 90 degrees Fahrenheit or something. Or close to 100 degrees. So the inside temperature is probably under 5, 600. That's my guess. So I don't remember the solution. So let's take a look at, oh, the, okay. It's more than what I was expecting, actually. All right. So here's the initial volume. Here's the final volume. All right. So initial temperature in terms of Kelvin. All right. So what is the final temperature? So here's the gamma factor for adiabatic compression or expansion. All right. So the initial temperature is 105 degrees. So what would be the final temperature? So I'm just got me curious. I don't know when the last time I did this lecture. Okay, so there's going to be sudden compression, so the temperature is going to go up. The algebraically, this is straightforward. You'll find the math portion of the multiple choice pretty easy, but you need to know which one must to use, obviously. All right, so in terms of Kelvin, the temperature goes up quite a bit. All right, in terms of Celsius, you end up getting this. In terms of Fahrenheit, it's going to be all oh, for 1450 degree Fahrenheit. I was up by like a thousand degrees. Okay, wow. So the temperature goes up quite a bit inside the engines. Okay, so when there's a combustion, I thought we were at 450 or 500 degrees, so I was off by a thousand. Okay, I expected because it happens so fast. I expected gas to heat up, but I didn't realize that it's just it hits up to an extent because of the exponential factor, the power that we were looking at, because of the exponent or the not the exponent, the power that we were looking. At. I mean, this this makes a huge difference, and that's what I was getting at. All right, so at the end of it. Notice that it's 1,400 something, 1,450 Fahrenheit that we end up getting. Okay, everything that we've done so far is fine. I like it. It's mathematical modeling, which is a derivation. And then we did an example problem. And I'm assuming that this example problem is from a book. It's, though I don't like using the uh, SI units in setting up the problems because I want you guys to get an intuitive sense of what's going on using the units that you guys are used to. I think this is a fairly realistic problem. And, and this is what the initial stages of the lecture preparation kind of looks like. This is probably the second, the third, or the fourth time I'm giving this lecture. So I, things are a little bit all over the place. And more I give it, the better that usually the lectures get. But one of the things that I want you to realize, which is worthy of a discussion, is the physics that we're not discussing at this point, and which is rarely ever discussed in most of the physics classes, because they pass this as physics, which is everything that I've done so far is not real physics. What's missing here is a discussion about what happens to the molecules. That's missing. All right, so at this point, we need to discuss physics. Okay, so we've done enough goofing around. Why does the temperature rise up to that extent when there's a sudden compression? 
All right. All right. So, guys, when there's a sudden compression, you got the piston, and the piston is compressed, which means that there's a tremendous amount of work being done on the piston, right? So, there's force, and the force is causing displacement. And there's force acting on the air mass, and the air mass is getting displaced into a smaller opening. So, a tremendous amount of energy is transferred to the air mass. All right. So remember, the work is a process of transferring energy. So the energy literally gets transferred to the molecules, and the amount of energy gets transferred to the molecules will appear in the form of the kinetic energy of the molecules. You got it? Which means that when you press everything, molecules are like tennis balls. They become energized. And their average kinetic energy is the temperature. That's it. Notice that all this work that you, we've done is simplified to something that you can understand at the end of it. Now we've done physics. Okay? That the, the whole idea was getting to, getting to the point uh, hey, what's going on with the molecules, pal? What happened? Because that's the you have to keep your you have to keep your eye on the ball. In this case, the ball are the molecules. All right, you need to keep focusing on the molecules. What's going on with the molecules? All the physics that we discussed all of a sudden came into play. Remember, work is a process of transferring energy. The work is what happens when there's a force causing displacement. Piston is moving in the dominant direction. Piston applies a force pressure on the molecules. Pressure is the amount of force per area, remember. So you're applying a force on each and every single molecule at the same time. You're just playing those molecules in the downward direction. It is like you have this tennis racket. Instead of hitting a single tennis ball, you're hitting trillions of trillions of tiny little molecules, the tennis balls at the same time. And all of a sudden, they move faster. The speed of these molecules is exactly the same as the temperature of the environment. And in the, the case of a diesel engine, your pressures are so much higher as well so you expect that temperature to be higher as also, right? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, can you... I'm going to give you 20 more points. Just hold on to that one, because that's the... Uh, uh, okay, uh, Mike, I think you're the only one who's going to be enjoy, enjoying this following lecture. Yeah, you're right on that, because now we're going to talk about the heat engines shortly, as soon as I'm done with this. We are just laying down the foundation. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, okay, let's take a look at this one. All right, so we're looking at a car engine. Uh, so we're looking in, inside of a, one of the cylinders of a car engine. There's an explosive com combustion of the fuel. So now we're looking at the initial pressure. And then we, we're giving the initial pressure and the initial volume. And then the piston is going to expand, right? And that's happening adiabatically, so it's happening fairly fast to different volume. So what's the final pressure? So the gamma constant is assumed to be 1.4. So we're assuming an ideal gas situation. So volume is going to expand. So as soon as the volume expands, we expect, expect a huge drop in pressure. So the pressure is going to drop. Volume is going to expand. The pressure is going to drop. OK. How much the pressure is going to drop? It's going to drop quite a bit in this case as well. Uh, this is, uh, OK, so initial to final volume. So we are looking at expansion. Initial pressure, so what's the final pressure? So the gamma is given expansion or compression factor term that I use. I, I don't know if anybody else has. And boom, boom, boom. And then so the pressure goes down from this value to that value. It's almost a factor of um, the difference is almost a thousand. Okay, so that wasn't that interesting. But the previous one was. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics, which is the conservation of energy, obviously, free expansion. Okay, so what is a free expansion? You got the gas here, and then and, and then you open up the valve. And then boom, the vacuum is gonna get filled up with gas. Okay. Gas is the gas is expanding in this case. This is one of those things. It took me forever to I didn't take me forever to understand. There are little things I used to miss, like most of you guys do, uh, which is normal. And after a while, you go, something is weird. For example, when a gas is expanding, I don't know, you heat up the gas, it's expanding. So when you heat it up, what happens? You're energizing the molecules, so it goes into the internal energy of the gas. And then even if it's a, if it's a gas like oxygen, it starts to expand. It starts to do work against the other air mass while it's expanding because it's pushing the other molecules out of the way. So its internal energy starts to go down. So they usually, when you're talking about an expansion of gas or whatever, the expanding gas usually does work on something while trying to create space for itself. Now here, the gas is going to expand into a vacuum. So it's not going to push up against anything to create space for itself. So freely expanding gas, expanding into your vacuum is not going to do any work. That's what I'm getting at. All right, so this is one of those things that you, I want you to just realize if the gas is allowed to expand into your vacuum, it's not going to, it's going into a bigger volume, but it's not creating a volume for itself. So which means that it's not doing any work on, on the surrounding environment. 
Also, there's not going to be any heat transfer in or out of the system. So, which means that the internal energy of the system should not change. All right, so no work is going to be done because of the simple reason that it's not it's not creating a, it's not creating a volume for itself to expand. Into. It's not pushing up against the surrounding molecules or whatever while it's expanding. It's not making room for itself. Okay. And then uh, during the free expansion, there's no heat transfer in out of the system. So which means that the internal energy of the system is not going to change, which means that it's, there's not going to be any temperature change. Okay, so it remains constant. Okay, so that was one of the last concepts from this chapter. All right, so this brings us